The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Revive Initiative, Reinforcing Evidence-Based Principles Against Cancer-Associated Venous Thromboembolism. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash CGE860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, my name is Alok Karana. I'm a medical oncologist at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And I welcome you to this program exploring evidence-based principles for managing cancer-associated VTE, known as the REVIVE Initiative, which stands for Reinforcing Evidence-Based Principles Against Cancer-Associated Venous Thromboembolism. During this activity, I'll share the current best practices for team-based risk assessment, primary prophylaxis, acute treatment, and secondary prevention of VTE in people with cancer, with a focus on the role of modern anticoagulant strategies. We've also prepared practice aids that summarize risk assessment tools for VT in cancer and provide quick insights on modern anticoagulants, so please download these resources before we get started. Let's begin. This slide displays the mechanisms of cancer-associated venous thromboembolism. As you can see from the multiple mechanisms shown here, thrombosis in cancer patients does not seem to be driven by a single mechanism, but rather by a conglomeration of different aspects of activation of coagulation, as well as activation of endothelial cells, release of inflammatory cytokines, activation of platelets, and so on. What all of these different things do is to lead to an overproduction of factors that tilt the landscape in the blood vessel towards coagulation. This is driven to a large extent by the role of the primary tumor. So tumor cells themselves can release tissue factor into the circulation, but also by other cells that are involved in the blood circulation, including activated endothelial cells, which can be activated by cancer cells, as well as activated by systemic therapy, such as chemotherapy by other blood cells in the circulation, such as monocytes, which can be activated to also release tissue factor, neutrophil extracellular traps, which may function to also release tissue factor and other procoagulant cytokines, and various inflammatory cytokines that can be released both by the tumor as well as by systemic therapeutic agents, including immune checkpoint inhibitors. And then finally, the role of activated platelets is also recently being recognized and appears to contribute to the hypercoagulability of cancer as well. So we're beginning to understand a lot about these multiple mechanisms that are involved in cancer. There have also been advances in treating the hypercoagulable state of cancer with advances in anticoagulation that have led to a host of modern preventive and treatment strategies for venous thromboembolism. The discovery of heparin is over a century old at this point, but it was only in the 1950s that the first randomized clinical trials showed that heparins or vitamin K antagonists, which were oral agents, would significantly reduce recurrence and death from PE or pulmonary embolism. In the 1980s, a newer form of heparin became standardized, which was low molecular weight heparins. These are subcutaneous, and it was realized as healthcare systems changed that low molecular weight heparins were both effective and safe for the home treatment of venous thromboembolism, and that became the norm in the 2000s until the mid-2010s. At the same time, a new wave of drugs was being developed for anticoagulation, known broadly as direct oral anticoagulants, and these targeted specifically factor 2 and factor 10. And widespread modern use of these drugs began in the mid-2010s and was expanded into the cancer population in the late 2010s when cancer-specific trials were conducted showing that these drugs were both effective and safe in the cancer population. And so there's been a big change from heparin to DOAX over the past several decades in both treatment and primary prevention of cancer-associated thromboembolism. Despite these advances, cancer-associated VTE remains a very big medical challenge for people with cancer. As you can see in this graph on the left, rates of VTE are quite substantial in people with cancer. If you look at all VTE in all cancer patients, you're looking at rates of close to 13%. So more than one in 10 cancer patients will get a blood clot. And this is much, much, much higher than control population adjusted for age and other comorbidities. And the only difference being that the control population doesn't have cancer. And as you can see in the non-cancer population, although the rates are high, they're nowhere near as high as the cancer population. And this extends across the board for all venous thromboembolism diagnoses 
so whether it's DVT only, pulmonary embolism only, or a combination of DVT and PE, generally speaking, rates are much higher in the cancer population. They do vary quite significantly according to the type of cancer, as shown on the right. Uh, so some types of cancers, such as pancreatic and stomach cancer, have very, very high rates of VTE, close to 20% for pancreatic cancer, again, compared to just 1.4% for control patients, which are the same age and have similar comorbidities but don't have cancer. Cancer-associated thrombosis, a combination of both venous and arterial thromboembolism, is also one of the leading causes of death in people with cancer, and so has important consequences, as we shall see. Another great concern is that not only is the risk of thromboembolism high in people with cancer, but it's also increasing. These are data looking at rates of VTE in cancer population or without cancer, between 1997 and 2017. And as you can see in the non-cancer population, the control population shown here in red, rates of ET have been fairly stable in this two decade time frame. But in the cancer population, they've risen steeply between 97 and 2017 and really are peaking in the 2017 time frame, which is the last year of this particular cohort study. And given that newer drugs since then, including immune checkpoint inhibitors are also associated with an increased risk of ET, one can only imagine that the rates have gone even higher compared to 2017. It should be noted that the risk of VT in people with cancer is not consistently high, but in fact, it varies over the course of the illness. The initial period of diagnosis when people are first diagnosed is a particularly high risk time frame. That's not just because the patients are just been diagnosed with cancer and have a high tumor burden, but also it may be related to the different treatments that are administered in this initial period after diagnosis. Complications or specific events that occur during cancer treatments, such as hospitalization, major surgery, acute medical illness, can further increase this risk. The risk appears to go down when people are in remission or the cancer is controlled. And in later periods, if the cancer were to recur or if it's metastatic or if there's a rising tumor burden or progression of cancer, a risk of thromboembolism increases again. Although preventative agents, known broadly as thromboprophylaxis, may reduce this risk. Cancer-associated VTE has several consequences for people with cancer. Some of them are listed here. Obviously, once you get a blood clot in a person with cancer, there's a need for prolonged therapeutic anticoagulation at least six months and in many patients indefinitely for as long as the cancer is active. And in turn, therapeutic anticoagulation is associated with an increased risk of bleeding. So they have to take a drug for a long period of time, and that drug may cause other problems such as bleeding. Even though newer drugs are very effective in treating cancer-associated VTE, the occurrence of one VTE is strongly associated with the risk of a second VTE, so high risk of recurrent VTE. There are costs associated with the treatment of VTE and its complications, which increases healthcare costs both to the healthcare system and to patients. Very relevant to cancer patients who are dealing with a major illness. This may delay or interrupt anti-cancer therapy, affect their quality of life, has been shown in multiple studies to worsen overall survival and increase short-term mortality, may add to the symptom and morbidity burden suffered by patients and add to their need for care, including increased risk of emergency room visits and hospitalizations. So lots of bad consequences for people with cancer once they have a diagnosis of a cancer-associated VTE. Our goals for today then are to better understand and augment your knowledge of thromboembolic risk factors, look at new guideline recommendations. We have updates from major societies, including ASCO and ASH, and to understand the current evidence supporting modern anticoagulation strategies. I hope this talk will equip you with the skills you need to develop risk-adapted prophylaxis and treatment strategies for cancer-associated VTE. And we also hope to provide guidance on practical aspects of VTE management in the cancer setting and helping counsel patients on elevated risk of VTE. Let's start with the first module, which is it takes a team focusing on strategies for risk assessment of cancer-associated VTE. What are the major risk factors for VTE in cancer? These can broadly be categorized as cancer-related, treatment-related, patient-related, and then biomarkers. The cancer-related are probably the strongest and most important, and of these, the type of cancer, so pancreatic cancer, primary brain tumor, gastric cancer, is most strongly associated with the risk for VTE. But other factors related to the cancer also play a role. The histology, so adenocarcinoma, for instance, has a higher rate than squamous cell cancer. Poorly differentiated cancers have a higher risk than moderately or well-differentiated cancer. We already talked about the initial period of diagnosis. Treatment-related factors include the types of treatments that are administered to patients, major abdominal surgery, hospitalization, systemic therapy with chemotherapy or immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, 
even interventions as simple as placing a central venous catheter or supportive care drugs such as erythropoiesis-stimulating agents or even blood transfusions can be associated with an increased risk of ADE. There are also patient-related risk factors. Older age is particularly associated. In the United States, African-American ethnicity is associated with an increased risk of ADE, as are several comorbidities, including pulmonary and renal disease. And simple biomarkers, as simple as the white count, the platelet count, the hemoglobin, and more complicated ones such as tissue factor, D-dimer, P-selectin, and others have also been all strongly associated with the risk of ADE in people with cancer. Because there are so many different risk factors, a risk assessment tool was developed by our research group about 15 years ago, which takes the five most important risk factors and puts them together to generate a score. And a score of two or higher on current guidelines is basically defined as high risk. You can get to two points by just having a very high-risk cancer, such as gastric or pancreatic cancer, or having a high-risk cancer, such as a lung cancer or lymphoma, that gives you one point, and then a combination of one of these other things, such as a high platelet count, a low hemoglobin, a high white cell count, or a high BMI. Note that you may have a patient with a cancer that's not considered a high-risk cancer, but if they have other risk factors, let's say a patient with breast cancer, which doesn't fall here in the site of primary cancer. So you get zero points for having breast cancer. But if you have a breast cancer patient with a high platelet count, a low hemoglobin, and a high white cell count, that could get you to three points or even four points with a high BMI. And that would make a patient high risk. So it's not just driven by the type of cancer, but by a combination of these different risk factors. We've collected information on this risk assessment tool and other resources for your practice, including links to online calculators. So please consider downloading these practice aids now. Now, this risk score has been validated in a variety of different studies. I'm just showing you one of several validation studies that show that even in the recent modern era, this risk score is associated with an increased risk of ETE, and the risk climbs the greater the number of points on this score, as shown in this graph. Multiple other risk assessment tools have also been developed. This includes from a group in Vienna that added factors such as the D-dimer and P-selectin, a PROTECT risk score which removes the BMI but adds the type of chemotherapy, and several other ones that are listed here. Currently, however, ASCO and guidelines continue to recommend only the CORONA score for risk assessment clinically. Some of these other scores are still undergoing validation. The exception to that rule is two scores that have been developed specifically for the myeloma population, which is already at high risk for VTE, and those are impede and saved as shown on the bottom of this slide. Because myeloma is such a unique disease and has unique treatments that further drive its risk, especially the use of IMID agents, multiple factors unique to this disease have led to a couple of unique risk scores that have been developed in this population. Impede risk factors are all listed here, and any combination of these factors can lead you into either a low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk, as shown on the right. Here's a couple cases to illustrate how we can calculate or understand the risk to an individual patient. Here's a 72-year-old patient, David, who presents with a diagnosis of metastatic pancreatic adenocarcinoma with a mass in the pancreas and multiple liver metastases, presenting with fatigue. He does have a history of hypertension. His performance status is 1. His initial CBC shows a platelet count of 425,000 and a hemoglobin of 11. The patient is recommended palliative chemotherapy with the modified full phenox regimen, and he prepares to initiate this treatment. Remember, patients are particularly at risk at this initial period of diagnosis and this period when treatment is started. And so what factors in this particular case would raise your team's vigilance for VTE risk? I think just having pancreatic cancer, which is well-recognized to be one of the highest risk cancers for VTE, should set off some alarm bells. And based on the validated tool that we just discussed, that alone gives you two points, which automatically qualifies you to be considered for trauma prophylaxis. In this particular patient, we also note a high platelet count, which further adds to the risk. And so based on a score of three, this patient is at high risk and would benefit from thromboprophylaxis. So this is an example that probably occurs every day in multiple offices. Patient with pancreatic cancer about to start first-line treatment for metastatic disease and at high risk for VTE. Here's another case. This is in a patient with multiple myeloma who presents with a symptomatic disease. She does have anemia with a hemoglobin of 9, and some of her other markers are listed here. Her BMI is also elevated at 36. Her healthcare team decides to treat her with a regimen that contains lenalidomide, and the goal is to go to lenalidomide maintenance therapy after initial treatment. 
based on the impede scoring, you would assign at least one point for the elevated BMI, four points for the planned use of IMID, two points for planned use of DEX. And so this patient is considered to be at intermediate risk based on the impede score and should be considered for thromboprophylaxis as well. More recent risk score specifically for myeloma is called the PRISM score, which also incorporates abnormal cytogenetics and other variables such as the prior history of VTE, race ethnicity. And again, for this patient, I may use an induction therapy. And if this patient also had abnormal metaphase cytogenetics, that would further drive the risk. And you can see here, a high risk defined as a score of seven or higher would further increase the risk of VTE in this particular patient. So now that we've discussed how risk can be assessed and how high-risk patients can be identified, what can we do about it? I think one of the most important things to consider is the primary prevention of BT in the cancer setting. And that's what the second module is about. Not simply gathering information, but also acting on it to reduce this burden of BT in the cancer population. Currently, almost every single guideline that addresses this issue does, in fact, make a recommendation or suggestion, depending on the language, for ambulatory patients with cancer. So we're talking here primarily about cancer outpatients. Obviously, cancer inpatients, post-surgical patients certainly should be considered for prophylaxis. But focusing on the outpatient population, which is where a majority of cancer patients live and where a majority of cancer patients get blood clots, ASCO, NCCN, ITAC, ISTH, and ASH all, generally speaking, recommend primary thromboprophylaxis, but risk adapted. So not in all cancer patients patients, but only in cancer patients that are deemed to be at high risk. As you can see in most of these guidelines, that high risk is defined as a RANA score of two or higher, or myeloma patients receiving an IMID-based regimen. And for most of these patients, the recommendation is either low molecular heparin or direct oral anticoagulant therapy with apixaban or rivaroxaban. The exception to that rule is the allowing of aspirin in patients with myeloma only. But for solid tumor patients, which is the majority of our population, it's generally recommended that either low molecular heparin or a DUAC be considered. Post major surgery, also it's important to consider thromboprophylaxis. And again, most guidelines that address this issue, including ASCO, NCCN, and ITAC and ASH, all recommend anticoagulant prophylaxis for at least seven to 10 days post surgery and up to four weeks after discharge in high risk patients. ASCO's guidelines are recently updated to include apixaban and rivaroxaban also as options for extended pharmacologic prophylaxis after cancer surgery, specifically abdominal or pelvic surgery. In the past, only low molecular heparin was considered in this setting, but that has been changed. And the other guidelines continue with the older recommendations. Where does this evidence to support primary prevention with DOAX come from? There have been a host of clinical trials using DOAX as well as low molecular heparins in the cancer outpatient setting. The two most recent randomized trials are shown here, Avert and Cassini. Avert used apixaban, Cassini used rivaroxaban. Both of these were risk adapted, so they focused on a high-risk cancer population defined as a corona score of two or higher and enrolled a substantial number of patients, as you can see from here. Because of time constraints, we can't go into every single randomized trial that's been done, but just to give you a flavor of the benefit as well as the safety issues, these are results from AVERT in which prophylactic apixaban was associated with a substantial reduction in risk of VTE. So AVERT took a population of patients with a corona score of 2 or higher. The score was accurate in predicting a high risk of VTE. About 10% of patients in six months developed a VTE in the placebo arm. If they received apixaban, that number dropped from 10% down to 4%, so about a 60% relative risk reduction, a 6% absolute risk reduction. And this was associated, as expected, with a slight increase in major bleeding with a hazard ratio of 2 and a slight increase in clinically relevant non-major bleeding with a hazard ratio of 1.28. If you take together all the different clinical trials that have been done, this is a large pooled analysis of multiple randomized trials, including low molecular heparins and DOAX. You get a better sense of what is the number needed to treat to prevent one VTE in the cancer setting in patients who are at high risk for developing VTE. And depending on where you define that high risk, you can see here for outcomes such as patients with a corona score of two or higher, 25 patients need to be given a anticoagulant to prevent one VTE. That number is slightly higher if it's just a score of two. It's much lower if it's a score of three or higher. So like the patient we discussed earlier who had pancreatic cancer plus a high platelet count, so a score of three, number needed to treat is around 17 to prevent one VTE, which is considered very acceptable in the primary prevention setting. Thankfully, major bleeding was not a big concern in this large meta-analysis. You can see number needed to harm is basically not significant. And in terms of mortality, although none of these studies were designed to show an impact on mortality, the sample size would have been much larger. They all show 
sort of trend towards improved mortality and certainly no concern for worse than mortality. So very reassuring safety signals in this large meta-analysis. What about medical patients who are admitted to the hospital and patients are admitted for medical reasons like pneumonia or admitted sometimes for elective chemotherapy in the hospital. For patients who have an acute medical illness, ASCO, NCC, and ITAC and ASH all recommend anticoagulant prophylaxis during hospitalization, and this can be discontinued after discharge. So three settings for primary prevention, ambulatory patients with a high risk, post-surgical patients in the immediate post-surgical period, as well as in the extended post-surgical period, and hospitalized patients with an acute medical illness. So you talked a lot about primary prevention. How best can we implement primary prevention in our practice? And for that, we turn to some institutions that are doing it successfully. Probably the best example of a successful primary prevention approach in the outpatient setting comes from the University of Vermont that was published in one of the JCO journals recently. What they created was a structure based on electronic medical record risk assessment tools. So each patient's chrono score was calculated based on the information that's already present in the EMR. High-risk patients were identified, and then either oncology nursing or pharmacy would be notified if there was a high-risk patient. They would approach the patient while they were getting their chemotherapy set up. And our discussion was made about whether they qualified for thromboprophylaxis, what were the risks, what were the benefits, and then patients would agree to go on prophylaxis or not. As you can see with this graph here, in the post-implementation phase of this protocol, in their practice, about 213 patients, or 23% of the practice, was identified as high risk. Referrals to hepatology were offered to about 151 patients. Presumably, those with a risk of bleeding were excluded. And of those patients that were referred to their service for primary prevention, nearly 94% of patients received VT prophylaxis. So this is a very successful example going on for a couple of years of being able to not only identify high-risk patients, but also to act on identifying those high-risk patients and recommending prophylaxis and making sure patients go on prophylaxis. So such epic EHR tools, I think, can be used to support prophylaxis, as you see on this slide here. But it is important to know that it takes multidisciplinary team to implement prophylaxis in the cancer setting. Conversations between patients and oncologists are very much focused on the cancer treatment and the cancer staging and the benefit of the chemotherapy. And so there's very little time or priority assigned to primary prevention approaches for essentially a supportive care issue, which is prevention of VTE. And so involving other people, such as cancer center pharmacists or cancer center nursing in this may be a different way to approach primary thromboprophylaxis as seen in this Vermont model. So re-looking at the patient that we had seen earlier with pancreatic cancer who had a score of three, this is a good patient that we could discuss having what is the risk of a blood clot, what are the consequences of a blood clot, what is the benefit from going on a low-dose direct oral agent versus a low molecular heparin, are there concerns about bleeding, Particularly in the pancreatic cancer population, actually, there's very little increased risk of major bleeding. And there have been other randomized trials just in the pancreatic cancer population. So we know a lot about patient safety in this specific population, as well as we know that pancreatic cancer patients are at very high risk for VTE. So this is a patient that I think, in my opinion, would be a very good candidate for thromboprophylaxis. And this would be supported by current ASCO, ASH, and NCCN guidelines. Dosing for this is different than the therapeutic setting. So for the DOAX, it would be 2.5 milligram twice daily for apixaban, 10 milligram once daily for rivaroxaban. And then for daltiparin and oxaparin, it would also be a prophylactic dose and not a full therapeutic dose. The inoxaparin study is used about 1 milligram per kilogram sub-Q daily for the first three months. So we've talked about risk assessment, we've talked about primary prevention, what happens when patients with cancer actually do end up getting a blood clot? How do we manage that? How do we prevent a second blood clot from happening? How do we manage the risk of bleeding? That's what we'll discuss in module three. So there's been several guideline updates on the primary treatment and prevention of ET recurrence in people with cancer. ASCO guidelines were recently updated to expand on the number of options available to cancer patients. And the ASCO guidelines divided the treatment phase into two subphases. One is the initial period of anticoagulation, patient who presents with a DVT or a patient who presents with a PE. There's an initial anticoagulation phase that could happen in the emergency room. If the patient is being hospitalized, it could happen in the hospital. Or if it's a stable patient that can be treated in the outpatient, it's still the first few days after this diagnosis that we would treat in the outpatient setting. And in this initial phase, ASCO allows for the use of unfractionated heparin, so like a heparin drip, low molecular heparin, fornaparinux, rivaroxaban, or apixaban. 
A second phase or the long-term phase is continuing on anticoagulation for the next several months. And really ASCO and pretty much every major guideline recommends at least a six-month period of treatment of BTE. This is a minimum six-month period, not a maximum. And for this extended period or long-term anticoagulation period, because there's no data on foreign parallax and because unfractionated heparin obviously is not really viable for a six-month period, it restricts the options to low molecule heparin and three DOACs, idoxaban, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. And I picked these three DOACs because each one did a randomized clinical trial in the cancer setting specifically. The data to support the expansion of DOACs as options for both the initial phase and the long-term phase comes from a couple of different clinical trials. So I just wanted to discuss a couple of representative clinical trials. SELECT-D was one of those randomized clinical trials that looked at BT recurrence rates after randomization with rivaroxaban or placebo and essentially showed a reduction in the risk of recurrent VTE with rivaroxaban, although it did show an increased risk of major bleeding. This was a relatively smaller randomized clinical trial. There was also an increased risk of clinically relevant non-major bleeding as well in this setting. One of the lessons learned from the SELECT-D trial was that bleeding seemed to be restricted to cancer patients with a GI primary, particularly gastric or esophageal primary. And so moving forward, many trials either did not screen for or excluded some of these patients from inclusion into the clinical trial. But overall, this showed a high degree of success in preventing recurrent VTE, but with some concern raised for risk of bleeding. More recent trials using apixaban seem to be associated with a lower major rate of bleeding and VTE recurrence rates. Adam VTE was one of those trials. This was also, like SELECT-D, a smaller randomized trial. As you can see, risk of major bleeding was not substantially elevated with apixaban. More evidence to support the treatment of acute VT in the cancer population with a direct oral agent comes from the Caravaggio trial. That was a very large randomized trial that was published in the New England a couple of years ago. And what this trial did was randomize patients with a new diagnosis of VTE to either apixaban or deltaparin that apparent being the control arm. As you can see from the graph on the left, there's actually a substantial reduction in the risk of recurrent VTE, the hazard ratio of 0.63. And consistent with the other DOAC trials, that DOACs are a little bit more effective at reducing recurrent VTE in the cancer population. And overall, the study was designed as a non-inferiority study, and it found that oral apixaban was non-inferior to subcutaneous deltaparin, which is the FDA-approved standard of care in this trial for the treatment of cancer-associated VTE. A very recent publication also speaks to the early time course of VT recurrence. And as early as day 7, day 30, and certainly by day 90, you can see in the table on the right, a substantial number of patients do in fact develop recurrent VTE. But apixaban was effective at reducing recurrent VTE across all of those three time points, and at least similar to deltaparin, if not slightly better, again, as consistent with the overall findings of the trial. And so the findings of this study certainly support the use of apixaban for both the initial or the early phase of anticoagulation, as well as the long-term treatment of VTE in the cancer setting. The concerns that were raised in the early clinical trials of leading in the GI cancer population did not appear to happen in the Caravaggio trial. So this slide shows the principal safety outcome. You can see major bleeding rates essentially overlap. And so the conclusion was there was actually no increased risk of major bleeding with apixaban in the setting of cancer population with active cancer. All of these trials have addressed risk of VT, secondary VT up to six months. There's very little data on what to do once the six-month time frame has elapsed. In general, ASCO, ASH, and CCM guidelines recommend continuing anticoagulant therapy past six months if the cancer is active or if patients are on active anti-cancer treatment. There is an ongoing study shown here, a PCAT study, which actually randomizes people after they've finished six months of treatment to either the full dose of apixaban or a reduced dose of apixaban to see if we can get away with uh, lowering the dose of anticoagulation after the six-month period. Until these results are back, most of us would favor continuing on the dosing that's worked in preventing recurrent VTE in patients with active malignancy or receiving active treatment for malignancy. If the cancer is in remission and patients are no longer on treatment, then I think it's reasonable to consider stopping at the six-month timeframe. But that's definitely a discussion to be had with individual patients.
So to summarize, what is a good treatment algorithm for cancer-associated VTE? For reasons of time, we didn't get into drug-drug interactions, but some of the DOACs can have substantial interactions with the concomitant CYP3A4 or P-glycoprotein inducers or inhibitors. So we do have to look at drug-drug interactions. Here's a simple algorithm that we follow and many other physicians also follow in their practice, which is, let's say you have a patient with an acute cancer-associated VTE, and we just ask three simple questions. One, do they have any major impairment of function of a liver, kidneys, or the GI tract? Two, are there any drug-drug interactions with DOACs? And three, are they at high risk for bleeding? And again, I pointed out earlier, this is mostly esophageal or gastric cancer bleeding. Most patients, the answer will be no to these questions. And in that case, we would prefer a direct oral anticoagulant, such as ipixaban, idoxaban, or rivaroxaban. If the answer is yes, then you could consider a low molecular weight heparin. Again, patient preference is important here also. And so we want to talk it over with patients. In the US, the cost of low molecular weight heparin, even though it's generic, can be substantially greater than a direct oral anticoagulant. So you want to make sure you discuss those implications as well with people with cancer. But as I said, the majority of patients would qualify for a DOAC and would do just fine on a DOAC. So here's an example of a case. This is a 55-year-old woman with a known ER positive or two negative metastatic breast cancer. She's currently been treated with a CDK inhibitor. And after initiating treatment, she develops a VTE when a restaging scan shows a PE. The patient's creatinine clearance is 31. Would you prefer a DOAC in this setting? And what is the appropriate dose? This is somebody, I think, that would do well with a DOAC. This is a hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. We expect this patient to have a substantial life expectancy, and we don't want to not treat an acute VTE, particularly a PE. If the patient's stable hemodynamically, is not very symptomatic, this is somebody that I would treat on an outpatient basis. And you could start with a DOAC such as a pixaban or a roxaban, or you could consider a loma liquid heparin. There's no wrong answers here. I would certainly have a substantial preference for a DOAC because this is not a patient that has a high chance of bleeding. It's metastatic breast cancer. The summary doesn't say anything about any involvement of the GI tract. So assuming there's no drug-drug interactions with the drug that she's on, I would favor either a pixaban or a roxaban at least for six months in this setting. And then reassessing at six months to see what is the ongoing risk of VTE and if they have metastatic metastatic disease and continue on treatment, then that's somebody that I would consider treating indefinitely if they've done well with the drug. A quick note about the use of DOACs in renal insufficiency. There is variable renal elimination, as you can see in the first column towards the left across different DOACs. For some, it's very high renal elimination, such as dabigatran. Others, it's a little bit lower. Bioavailability also varies. But generally speaking, for a patient like we just discussed, I think a DOAC would be quite reasonable. Let's look at another case of treatment and secondary prevention. Mark is a 65-year-old patient with a recent diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer with metastases who presents with shortness of breath. He's had no active bleeding, so no hemoptysis. Performance status is one. Molecular testing of his uh, tumor reveals a ROS1 rearrangement. At some point during the course of his treatment, he undergoes a restaging scan, and unfortunately, this shows a pulmonary embolism. So what's the next steps needed to treat and prevent recurrent VTE in this setting? I think one of the important things to discuss is that this is what we call an incidentally diagnosed pulmonary embolism. So the patient was sent for a restaging scan and that showed a PE. This actually happens quite often, maybe about 40% of the time people are diagnosed incidentally, but the outcomes of incidental PE are very similar to symptom diagnosed PE. So similar rates of recurrent PE and similar association with mortality and hospitalization and other bad outcomes. So for somebody like this, we would definitely treat, even if it was incidentally diagnosed, I would definitely recommend treatment of acute PE in this setting. A second thing to note here is the risk factor that we actually didn't have a chance to get into, which is the ROS1 rearrangement. ROS1 and ALK mutations are very strongly associated with the risk of VTE about 30 to 40% of the time, so really one of the highest molecularly defined subgroups. Third is the choice of anticoagulation I think that we need to consider. By guidelines, could be treated by either a direct oral anticoagulant or low molecular heparin therapy. For this patient, assuming there's no drug-drug interactions, I would favor a direct oral anticoagulant because this is somebody who is going to likely be on treatment for a long period of time and does carry a high risk of recurrent VTE. Risk of recurrent VTE is generally lower with a direct oral anticoagulant. The risk of bleeding in the latest studies like Caravaggio was not increased, and this patient doesn't seem to be 
be at a particularly high risk for increased risk of bleeding. There's no recent bleeding and there's no hemoptysis. So this is definitely a patient I would favor using a DOAC on, such as apixaban or rivaroxaban. The duration of treatment is important. I would favor at least six months and probably longer if they remain on ROS1 targeted therapy. And then it's also very important to make sure that patients understand the risk of recurrent VTE, understand warning signs and symptoms, and understand the importance of adherence to anticoagulation because recurrent VTE could be life-threatening in this setting. So to summarize, we've discussed risk assessment, we've discussed primary prevention, we've discussed treatment management, we've discussed issues around treatment management. Just a few take-homes before we conclude. I think it's amply clear to all of us who take care of people with cancer that cancer-associated thromboembolism is a major complication of both cancer and its treatments. And it has substantial consequences for people with cancer, including a worsened risk of mortality and delay in treatment. The good news is that the risk is not even across the cancer population. Many patients are not at very high risk. And risk assessment tools can help us identify both high-risk and low-risk patients. And only the high-risk patients need to be targeted for primary prevention. Primary prevention has been shown to be both relatively safe and effective in preventing primary VTE. And depending on the level of risk, the number needed to treat can be quite low. And there are several agents available, as we discussed, including DOAX and low molecular heparins for primary prevention. For secondary prevention and treatment also, treatment options have expanded greatly, and DOACs have really led a paradigm shift favoring outpatient treatment. Risks of recurrent VTE are substantially reduced. Risk of bleeding is also very manageable. In the current era of anticoagulation, 95% of cancer patients will not have a recurrent VTE and not have major bleeding. And we really move the needle here in terms of patient benefit. However, it's important that we continue patient and provider education efforts so that everybody's aware that cancer patients are at high risk for VTE. Cancer patients are aware about the warning signs and symptoms of DVT and PE, and prevention efforts are ongoing so that we can together reduce the public health impact of VTE on people with cancer. Thank you very much for your attention. This concludes our exploration of evidence-based principles for the management of cancer-associated VTE. I hope you found this activity informative and useful for your practice. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CGE 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from the Bristol-Myers Squibb and Pfizer Alliance.